Welcome. Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. So pleased to have you here with us. My name is Jenny Miller. I'm the executive director of the Global Climate and Health Alliance, um, one of the organizing one of the organizations that has um, come together to host this health dialogue uh, as part of day one of the Race to Zero virtual event. We're very pleased to have you here with us. Um, and to, this is the final session of the Health Dialogue and it is focused on adaptation and resilience. In one of the very first sessions today, uh, Sir Andy Haynes said, "What we must adapt to what we cannot prevent and we must prevent what we cannot adapt to. And many of the earlier sessions during today were more focused on preventing uh, climate change um, to reduce the impacts that we'll be facing down the road um, with clean energy, low carbon transport and various types of things like that. This session is squarely focused on adapting to those things that we cannot pre prevent. We know that climate change is already impacting communities and countries around the world. Uh, and that that will continue no matter what we do by way of mitigation. And we also know that those impacts are not, not the same. Uh, some countries really are facing um, the, like very severe impacts already uh, and, and are on the front lines of, of climate change. Um, so in this session, we're gonna dive into some of what those impacts are and what it takes to, to adapt and become resilient to, um, to those impacts and the role that health should play in our thinking about adaptation and resilience. Um, and we're gonna focus on the critical actions we need to be taking to adapt to the impacts we can't avoid. So before we get started in hearing from our wonderful slate of speakers today, a couple of quick um, virtual meeting housekeeping points. Um, we will have the opportunity to take some questions from the audience. Um, if you'd like to pose a question, please post it in the Q&A using the Q&A function and do that as we go along as a speaker is speaking, if a question occurs to you, go ahead and post it. And that helps us to be able to begin to um, uh, identify those questions and, and elevate them. Then in addition, if you have an interest in sharing what you're hearing on social media, we encourage you to do that. Um, we are using the hashtags, hashtag race to zero, as well as hashtag healthy recovery. So now to to frame the challenge that we're facing. I would like to introduce um, the COP High Level Climate Action Champion, Mr. Gonzalo Munoz, um, and, and turn to him to, to start us out with some framing remarks. So over to you, Mr. Munoz. Thank you very much, Jenny, and thank you for setting not only the, let's say the room, but also the tone. Uh, as you have properly highlighted, it's, it's not only about mitigating, it's so much about resilience and, and doing both things at the same time. We know climate change threatens human health directly through, of course, extreme weather events such as storms, heat waves, droughts and floods, but also indirectly by, for example, reducing the quality of air that we breathe, increasing the transmission of climate sensitive diseases such as malaria, dengue and diarrheal diseases. And degrading the essential systems that we depend on for our health and our livelihoods, such as ecosystems and agriculture. Climate change is not selective. It is a global problem that affects each and every one of us. Some populations and communities face disproportionate health risks from climate change due to differences in vulnerability. Small island developing states are among the most vulnerable and are already experiencing adverse effects of climate change through increased floods, storms, and sea level rise that lead to death and injuries, severe damage and in, of infrastructure, loss of livelihoods, and population displacement. Many of developing nations have low technical and financial capacity to adapt to the impacts of climate change. Biodiversity, a broken food system, water and sanitation services, as well as the functioning of health systems and healthcare facilities are already being threatened. 
within countries' marginalized groups, whether it be from social, economic, cultural, institutional, or other factors, are also in need of increased protection and support. Local communities, including indigenous populations, are expected to experience widespread negative impacts of climate change on their lives on a daily basis. We must engage in this fight with the notion that no one is left behind. It is absolutely unacceptable to let the prediction of 100 million more people being pushed into extreme poverty from climate change by 2030 becoming true. We have a moral duty to act on that. Our fight against the COVID pandemic must happen in parallel, while countries around the world are reducing carbon emissions to protect the most vulnerable from climate risks and to gain the health co-benefits of mitigation policies. This year, and I would say even today, during, uh, during the first day of the uh, Race to Zero Dialogues, we have learned so much about the importance of gaining resilience on every system. The Race to Zero is a race not only to zero emissions, it's a race to zero poverty, it's a race to zero hunger, it's a race to zero inequalities. And we also learned about the importance of acting with the highest level of empathy towards the most vulnerable. So as, as the high level champion for COP26, speaking on behalf of myself and, and Nigel, we are committed that this race is about that. It's about a race that increases empathy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Munoz. That's an, an extraordinary way to frame how we should be approaching these challenges. Um, and I, I think does indeed set uh, e exactly the right tone for um, the rest of this conversation. Um, we are all in this uh, climate change uh, challenge together. Uh, and yet it's impacting people differently in different places. And that empathy is what will bind us together. Um, so thank you for those framing remarks. Uh, I, I now would like to introduce um, Mr. Elhaj Asi, who is currently co-chair of the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board and is the former Secretary General of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. And I think in bo both roles, we'll have some perspective on the issues that we are here to discuss today. So over to you, Mr. C. Thank you very much. Uh... Jenny, and good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening, uh, colleagues, you know, wherever you are, it's a great pleasure to, to join you very early morning from uh, Dakar, uh, Senegal. I remember in the middle of the very difficult negotiations during the Paris uh, Climate Conference, then Secretary General Ban Ki-moon was asked about his plan B. And his answer was, there was no plan, there's no plan B because there is no planet B. And I often uh, paraphrase that, you know, uh, working uh, with the largest uh, humanitarian network, the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Cross and Societies to often state myself, there is no humanity B as well. So we have only one planet that we uh, must all protect. We only have one humanity that we all must care for. But planet and uh, humanity do confront shocks and hazards. And now, unfortunately, more frequently, more severe. But shocks and hazards do not have to become disasters. So our level of preparedness if we have an early alert, an early warning, early action, and then when we act, are we building capacity or, or resilience so that communities have the capacity to withstand shocks, you know, when they come next time around, will be determining if those shocks and hazards will become disasters or not. So that is not a fatality. So we have a great responsibility here. And that responsibility is across a continuum, a continuum all the way from mitigation to adaptation. And it is quite important that, as I understand now in one of these last sessions, that we focus squarely on adaptation, because it is not just you know, about you know, preventing things, 
you know, from happening. So climate change will say affect our lives, our livelihoods, and also our ways of lives in many ways. But it affects us all, but we're not all equal in front of those challenges. When we talk about uh, vulnerabilities and resilience, as far as climate change is concerned, there are so many issues that do matter. Gender matters, age matters, disability matters. But most importantly, the place where you are born or you simply live will be determining pretty much you know, your level of risk and vulnerability. So we are not all equal. And those places are often you know, talked about as the most difficult places and they are most talked about the most vulnerable. And often in the jargons, you know, we talk about the last mile that we need to walk in order to make a difference. But if indeed these are the places you know, where the risks are greatest, and then people face very severe vulnerabilities, it should not be the last mile to walk, but the first mile of our response. So Gonzalo and others talk about the um, small island developing states, which some of us will call the big ocean states, you know, that are surrounded, you know, by water and then know on a daily basis what it means, you know, to adapt, you know, with these kind of challenges, you know, that we're talking about. Well, do what we need to do. You know, we need to have science, we need to have politics, and we need also activism. Science should guide, you know, what we're doing. And well, as may be obvious as it may sound to many of us, you know, we live nowadays, you know, in at times where there is so much denialism so many fake news amplified by you know, uh, social media that challenge you know, the basic you know, fundamentals that should be guiding our action. We have the science, let's be guided by the science. That is the first thing that we need to have. The second thing I believe is politics can be part of the problem or part of the solution. Let's make sure that we turn it part of the solution. We need also activism. So children uh, on the street, young people on the street, pay impatient, challenging us, you know, wanting action to happen now, and rightly so, because it is not only their present, it is also their future. And they are guiding us you know, in many ways, you know, that we need to not only think out of the box, but like they say themselves, get rid of the box altogether and engage you know, in action that will be saving lives, saving livestock, protecting livelihoods, and also our ways of lives. In order for that to happen, we need responsible leadership. And that is very important. I'm very happy to see you know, that in this panel, we also have political leaders and leaders you know, from uh, also all other ways of lives, you know, to show the way forward in a responsible manner. That leadership which is accountable, accountable to people, deliver on what is promised, but that alone is not sufficient. We need also engaged citizenship. You know, that will be claiming, you know, what is the right thing to do and also hold leaders accountable for mitigation, and incentivize action for adaptation. So health is a pertinent entry point you know, for that because it is a consequence as well as the response, but we mean health in the broad sense of the definition, not only the absence of disease or infirmity, but really a complete state like you know, WHO was saying of social and physical you know, well-being. And I would even expand it, you know, to the one health, you know, concept that will take into account human as well as animal health. Because the uh, challenges we face with climate change you know, are pushing us more and more in a kind of a pro promiscuous cohabitation between humans and animals and that cohabitation is often deadly 
because we're infringing into their natural habitat. Well, let me then finally mention what we, some of the things that we really need to do as some examples of actions. We must finance and finance heavily and invest, not just you know, as a uh, social investment or expense, but as an investment that will be you know, bringing dividends. And there we need also to innovate, like forecast-based financing. We know those places where we go year in, year out doing the same thing. And maybe if uh, we use you know, good weather data and you know, preposition resources, including money and supplies, you know, that could help you know, better adaptation. We need also to innovate you know, in the way infrastructure is being built. Simple things like elevating a little bit you know, more, you know, the sanitation infrastructure will be avoiding many waterborne diseases you know, in times of flood. Having temporary shelters you know, on a higher ground for livestock, like it happens in Bangladesh, has been protecting you know, livestock in many ways. And finally, you know, we need also not only to consider you know, the physical damages, but we need to look at the many invisible wounds that can be caused you know, by climate change and then take that into account in adaptation. And I like to see mental health and protection you know, be not being an afterthought, but right from the beginning in terms of you know, the strategies for adaptation. And finally, in order to achieve all of that, we need partnership. We need partnership you know, between government and the communities to start with. Partnership in the multilateral, within the multilateral system, within the UN and international financial institutions, partnership with the private sector, the insurance sector, and this calls for a multi-sectoral response for a problem which is multidimensional. And that is in the spirit of partnership that we also would like you know, to contribute from the GPMB, where I'm starting working now, and also my colleagues you know, of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent with 14 million volunteers on the ground, always there on the side of the communities in Italy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. C. That was uh, really um, an excellent overview of the kind of breadth um, of the issues that we're grappling here as we talk about having to adapt and become resilient in the face of, of this challenge. Um, and uh, I'm pleased now to turn to uh, a set of speakers who will help us um, take this to uh, more concrete terms and specific terms uh, situated in some of the countries that are experiencing some of these uh, gravest of impacts. Um, so I'd like to now introduce um, Dr. Mohamed Irfan Tarek, who is the Director General for Climate Change and Environment at the Ministry of Climate Change in Pakistan. I would also like to introduce Dr. Josephine Herman, who is the Director General of Health for the Cook Islands. And then as well, bring on Ms. Saima Wased Hossein, who is the thematic ambassador on vulnerability to the Climate Vulnerable Forum. And I'd like to start with a question that I'll uh, turn to each of you to address. Um, uh, so maybe picking up on anything that you'd like to pick up on from Mr. Munoz or Mr. C, um, could you then also talk about what do climate impacts mean for health from a national and a climate vulnerable perspective? So why don't we start with you, Dr. Herman? Kiorana Jenny, Kiorana colleagues. Um, if I may, um, our Honorable Minister Vaini Tuta Ivos Toki Brown has just arrived and she's now online. And I have asked if she can unmute and may she speak uh, on our behalf of the, of the Cook Islands. Wonderful. If you, if you, 
If we need a moment, um, perhaps I'll, I will begin with another speaker and then come back. I'm ready. Ah, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Minister. Thank you. Your Honor, Excellencies and esteemed colleagues, it is a pleasure to be present here today. On behalf of the government of the Cook Islands, may I acknowledge the organizers providing this opportunity so that a small island developing country such as mine and in other parts of the Pacific region may add our voice to the climate change narrative. We have a long road ahead and we are racing against time, but it is critical we follow this path to provide a better, sustainable and livable planet for generations to come. And some days we walk, other days we might jog, or hopefully for many days we might sprint. What is important is that we are moving onwards and forwards, learning from our failures, building on our successes, and advancing as a people, as a nation, as a region, and a global community. And we must not grow weary. Our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren are relying on us to do the right thing. Our convictions and beliefs must help drive our message of hope, hope for a future where through our collective efforts and the sharing of knowledge and intelligence, we will identify pragmatic and affordable measures to mitigate the impact of climate change. In 2018, Pacific Islands Action Plan on Climate Change and Health plan outlines the actions that small island developing states, such as the Cook Islands, need to take in order for all health systems in the Pacific region to be resilient to climate variability and change by 2030. This is an ambitious goal, but achievable. Climate resilient health systems require solid, quality standard, purpose-built infrastructure that can withstand the physical insults of extreme weather events, whether this is a king tide, a flood, a cyclone, or an environmental health disaster, such as a chemical contamination event. Climate resilient health systems must be time sensitive, flexible, versatile, and able to adapt to a wide range of threats, including COVID-19 and future pandemics, the NCD epidemic, antimicrobial resistance, and others that have yet to declare themselves. Droughts, heat waves, and cold spells will increase and have a direct impact on the health of populations. Measures to protect citizens must be established. Social and economic factors that widen disparities must be addressed. Climate resilient hospitals, health centers, and facilities and services require environments that are safe, green, smart, wash compliant, and energy is efficient. Patients must be confident that they have equitable access to universal health coverage, regardless of where they live, how much they earn, or how old they are. Of course, our health workers must have confidence that their work is supported by continuous quality improvement systems, that they are appreciated, and that their safety and welfare is a priority. In the Pacific region, we are adapting to the impact of climate change. In some low-lying atolls and islands, storm surge and sea level rises have resulted in salt water, intrusion into traditional planting fields, and water tables threatening our access to potable water, locally grown food, and good sanitation and hygiene. 
pink tides are leading to the racing of homes and for some planning for the relocation of displaced populations inland or offshore, as well as the disruption of livelihoods. Addressing the mental health illnesses arising from these extreme weather events and changes and the loss of traditional ways of life has required health systems to invest stretched resources to grow the mental health workforce. What we do know, however, is that rather than relying solely on the health workforce, we need to take our community with us. As a country, we cannot achieve climate resilient health systems without the help of our communities. COVID-19 has demonstrated the importance of involving our people in the decision-making process for our national emergency response. We have decentralized our health system to protect sick and vulnerable patients in hospital. We have established permanent refurbished community health clinics, taking primary health care services closer to our people. Investing in health has been a deliberate strategy and help secure and anchor a resilient community. While access to climate and health financing for Pacific Island countries has been poor, this is an area we will strengthen given our resource constraint budgets. Finally, imagine a future where sustainable, climate resilient and adaptable health systems are the norm. Where resilient communities have a say in the design and delivery of health services and where quality, affordable, equitable health services are available to communities when and where required. We must hope for a brighter future. We have come too far and had further to go. The clock is running and we have much work to do. Again, thank you for this opportunity. Yorana Ekemunia. Thank you so much, Minister. Uh, it is um, really um, uh, clear from your remarks that uh, you know health is a central consideration in thinking about adaptation and resilience, and yet adaptation and resilience are also much broader than healthcare systems and that the two have to, to come together and also to bring in the leadership of impacted communities and the perspectives of impacted communities in developing uh, our responses and our engagement on these issues. Um, and it also comes across so clearly just how serious the threat is for your country. Um, so now I'd like to turn to Dr. Irfan Tarek uh, from Pakistan, um, where uh, a different set of challenges, but uh, also quite significant, are being faced on account of climate change. So over to you, Dr. Irfan Tarek. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me clear. Yeah, right. Thank you very much and uh, a very good morning from uh, uh, very bright uh, Islamabad today. Um, let me start by uh, thanking WHO and the organizers for, organ for initiating an event which I thought has been quite delayed because, because of the connection between health and climate change. I would presume it, that it should have been priority one, uh, protecting environment, uh, prote protecting health from the impacts of climate change. Uh, I would start by a background from uh, Pakistan. And just to make the context a bit clear, Pakistan is a very diverse sort of a country with a huge population. Uh, we have ecological systems ranging from the deep seas to the 
the glacier mountains, which we call the third pole, uh, as, as it has the large, largest glacier uh, mass um, other than the poles. So the impacts of climate change, you can very well imagine from sea intrusion to glacial melts, which includes droughts, desertification, urban issues, rural environments. So all these ecological systems have a very diverse sort of impact from climate change. The second point which I just wanted to emphasize is that Pakistan contributes very little, less than 1% to, to global warming. However, we are, uh, according to the German Watch Index, one of the most, uh, uh, we have been in the list of most vulnerable countries for the last 20 years. The third point I just wanted to emphasize are we have a large population out of which 63% is uh, counted in the, in the workforce. But the point to note here is 30% of approximately 30% is below the poverty line. So the impact of climate change when degrading their health uh, completely devastates their mental and physical settings. And they, they lose their productive livelihoods. In this background, I think the only thing to do is to protect health. And I would compliment the suggestions made by Mr. Al-Hadi, creating partnerships, because we need to have a whole of society approach to protect health. Because as you see, in a population which is considerably uh, uh, um, below poverty line, the only thing, the only asset they have is health. So how do we do it? The Pakistani experience here, here is that we need to reflect health in our mm -hmm. major climate agendas. So it is for the first time that while we are revising our NDCs, we are trying to make sure that health is appropriately reflected as one of the sectors where we need to create resilience. We are working with different partners in, in looking after how to reflect this important issue in the NDCs. Secondly, I, we are also initiating the process of national adaptation plan, which you all must be aware. And we are trying to make sure that health occupies the highest priority in the, in the adaptation plan. Because as I just mentioned, our ecological systems provide us with diverse range of disasters and disease patterns from heat wave to dengue. All those climate induced disease patterns and disasters are impacting this country. So I, I, this was just a beginning which I just wanted to share our experience here in Pakistan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Irfan Tarek. Uh, and, um, you know, we've heard the, the biggest of picture uh, from, uh, from Mr. C and then start, started talking about sort of the 
impacts at the community level in the Cook Islands. And um, you addressed some of those things, but also took it to the individual level and the impacts that individuals are feeling and how they um, can go about their lives when they're, they're really um, uh, experiencing the, the, the impacts of climate change uh, in, in your case in, in Pakistan. Um, I'd now like to turn to Saima Hossein um, to bring us uh, your perspective on kind of the, the risks and the challenges um, to which we are having to adapt and become resilient, and particularly from your per perspective as Ambassador of Vulnerability at the Climate Vulnerable Forum. Um, so over to you. Uh. Thank you. So I'm so happy to be here and especially to hear the earlier remarks by our distinguished speakers that, you know, the main thrust of uh, what I've always advocated for is disability and mental health and really bringing that right into the conversation and seeing the political um, mandate for it is wonderful. Um, as the uh, thematic ambassador for 1.2 billion people that are uh, existing in the 48 countries of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, it's really uh, even more important to understand how the health impact, particularly for the most vulnerable groups within this population are impacted. And um, in addition to all of that, the infrastructure that exists, the, the health uh, policies that exist, the health programs that exist, the, that is already not the most robust and have a lot of gaps. So what often happens is for vulnerable groups, they who are already sort of falling through the cracks are even more likely to get, uh, um, uh, you know, to become even more marginalized because along with the fact that um, groups, um, which I, you know, I strongly advocate for, uh, a lot of the times we talk about uh, issues such as uh, disabilities in a very concrete uh, step, as disabilities that are easily understood, easily uh, recognized, we have steps to that. Um, but a lot of the hidden um, um, issues such as those with communication issues, those with autism, those with um, anxieties, that they we do we do not have the right preparations for it so uh, and we don't always understand how they are interpreting the information that is coming across how they're experiencing after they have been uh, going you know they've been sort of through a disaster kind of situation they've been displaced they do not have the support mechanisms um, in the recent years we've seen through especially through the pandemic is when you have these vulnerable groups and they don't have the support mechanisms you don't have the health infrastructure you don't have the support persons that they need and they just uh, they've lost their family members they're experiencing uh, additional um, challenges that how um, how how you would reach them is very dependent on how well you have planned I uh, especially appreciate Mr. Sai's uh, mention of the fact that we need, need to be multi-sectoral and multi-dimensional and health uh, it, it's really surprising how health has not always been a very concrete part as far as you know uh, when, when we talk about countries that are very vulnerable, like Bangladesh, have very robust community-based health systems, um, and, and a, due to our uh, frequent uh, natural disasters, a very good community-based mechanism to address uh, disasters like floods and cyclones. However, very soon in the, you know, we naturally realized that when it came to the issues of uh, disability, when it it came to issues of mitigating potential mental health condition, we weren't as prepared. And certainly the political um, uh, support for it is necessary, but a lot of the times we don't really know what would work. So having a good plan of action that exists within the system already went, has gone a long way in kind of being prepared when you are in a situation that, uh, uh, you know, you're extra vulnerable when, uh, due to climate change, you're 
your population and all your regular infrastructure is missing. So involving the community very early on in the preparedness, um, you know, having uh, people who work, the stakeholders uh, involved very early on and uh, ensuring that they understand all of the scenarios and what they need to do. Uh, we 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 in Bangladesh certainly have benefited a, a lot, uh, and we're slowly evolving to ensure that issues like um, not just those with mental health conditions, but also reducing the crisis when it comes to uh, the experiences that, and that can ultimately increase the vulnerability for uh, anxieties and stress preparing for that, not just, um, you know, all of us, we realize, especially with this pandemic, that, you know, our emotional uh, vulnerability increases. Um, so making sure there's the support mechanisms that are there that are multivaried and not just reliant on uh, the experts, but how we can help each other as a community um, comes from a good understanding what those needs are, what are the things to do, what are things not to do, um, and what are the, uh, you know, the cultural sort of support mechanisms that can be maximized. Many cultures that are, are strongly religious or have good social networks, it is important to empower them with the right information so that we can address misinformation that comes across, or we can also make the communities much more resilient and be um, more helpful to one another. Increasing the capacity of each individual and each community, I think, is a, you know, a key to ensuring greater resiliency. It's, uh, it's a key to uh, creating greater support mechanism along with having a, uh, a, an infrastructure that's, that fits in with each uh, country. And you know, as much as we'd like to say that there is universal mechanism or some ideas, they really aren't. We don't really know what would work best. And it has to, in many ways, be very specific to each uh, community and each country. Uh, what I, uh, one of the things that would, it would be very helpful is to be able to share that information, to learn from our mistakes, our failures, as well as success stories, and to emulate that in other countries that have sort of similar um, support mechanisms or similar challenges. Um, and I, I don't think in many ways we have enough of that because we're sort of learning as, as we go, but we often don't monitor uh, what has worked and what has not worked and we don't share. And I think conversations and discussions such as this would be wonderful opportunity to share some of those experiences and see what works so that we can really do better um as uh yeah okay. i'd like to so, yeah uh, well uh, your your point is an excellent one and and that's a actually a really good segue um to the the notion of, of sharing information and sharing understanding about what works and mm -hmm. um and i also wanted to draw out that you you talked about the need for for planning um, for planning with communities. And I wanted to turn back to, and actually um, if we could bring Dr. Herman into the conversation um, to ask the question of what does a good adaptation and resilience plan look like? And what does a good plan look like that really prioritizes health and brings the community in? Some of the things that the, the Honorable Minister mentioned. Um, what, is your, what are your thoughts on, on some of that? Rana, and thank you for that uh, question. I think um, it, it can't happen without the people. Um, that's what we've learned from COVID. And, and as much as COVID-19 has um, been uh, very disruptive and uh, a disaster for the whole world, we've taken from it the learnings. Uh, Cook Islands is still COVID free um, and, and we've guarded our border very, very aggressively. But in terms of adaptation and mitigation, we've learned, number one, we need to take our people with us. We need to include them in our decision-making processes. And that's what's happening at the moment where we have three pillars of society um, 
uh, the government, the Religious Advisory Council, and uh, our traditional leaders or houses, House of Arikis. And I think having that as well as our NGOs, our youth, and other stakeholder organizations, government, NGOs, private sector, it's helped us pull together to find the best solutions. We're a very small country. We have few resources. And so we need to be more efficient in the way we think and, and, and do things. So some of the big things we've thought about with climate change and adaptation and resilient health systems is really, what do we really need? We just need access. What are the basic things in life? Good water, clean, potable, not clean, potable water. Um, so we haven't uh, disinfected or chlorinated our water systems yet. So this is a whole debate going through the, our country at the moment. Um, clean water, good food, nutritious food that we plant and grow in the Cook Islands. Then of course, sanitation, you know, we need to make sure we can get rid of our waste um, and, and sustainably and um, having these three big ones and these others uh, making sure our environment is clean and all of that. We don't have much of an issue with air, but um, air pollution and all of that because we're so tiny in, in our little islands. But these are some of the big things. And of course, clean energy was mentioned earlier on this uh, afternoon, uh, earlier on uh, in this uh, webinar. So I think those are some of the big things I can think of in terms of mitigating. And I think the other thing that COVID-19 has taught us, which is also teaching us regarding how we uh, mitigate uh, and adapt to climate change is the decentralization of our health services. We have learned that infectious diseases don't do well when they're all in one place. And we've learned that we need to dilute COVID-19 by decentralizing our health services. So we have this big flash hospital on the top of the hill. We've taken our outpatients away from it. And as much as we were going into it, we've come back out. The thing is, two years ago, we were already planning to do this and COVID came and just accelerated all our processes. So um, I think there's lots of lessons COVID has taught us about infectious diseases. And then of course, it's helped us with climate change as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, e each of you uh, kind of anticipated questions that I was going to ask and, um, uh, you know, in, in uh, talking about solutions um, and, and also talking about how we build in health resilience in our COVID recovery. You know, pretty much everything that we're doing right now is um, under the kind of the shadow of the pandemic and in response to or in relationship to the pandemic. So um, I think uh, you're, it, it's interesting to, to hear that um, that has accelerated some of the resilience solutions that you were already looking at. Um, and it'll be interesting to, to consider where else we can take um, learnings from, from the virus and the pandemic uh, and use them to help us become more resilient and, and more adaptive. Um, so I wanna thank our uh, panelists um, and don't go away because I'd like to bring you back later, but I now need to move us on to our second set of speakers. Um, so for, for those who uh, can stick around, we hope you'll stay and join uh, a, a joint conversation at the end. Um, but at this time, I would like to now introduce um, uh, Dr. Diarmid Campbell-Lendrum, who is the climate change and health team leader at the World Health Organization, uh, and also Mr. Josh Carliner, who is the International Director of Program and Strategy at Healthcare Without Harm. And I have the great good fortune to work very, fairly regularly with both of these fine gentlemen. Um, and so the question that I would like to address to, to each of you in turn is, what are the major climate change impacts that you're seeing on different health systems globally? So we've been talking broadly about impacts of climate change and ad adaptation and resilience, um, but I'd like to drill down on the question of the impacts we're seeing on health systems themselves. And um, I'd like to start with you, Dr. Campbell-Lendrum, um, from the WHO perspective, um, what are you seeing in health systems around the world? Right, th thanks very much, uh, Jenny. It's a, a pleasure to uh, talk to you all. Um, uh, Mr. Assi mentioned at the beginning, it's good morning, good evening, good night, wherever you are 
it's coming up to four o'clock in the morning, um, just out, uh, outside uh, Geneva here. Um, as many of you know, we timed this session to make sure that we could hit the Pacific, uh, which is why I'm wearing my Buller shirt and, and wishing I was somewhere um, brighter and, uh, and, and warmer than I am at the moment. But it is a, <clears throat> a pleasure to talk to you all and, and it's really important to make that connection and get those voices from, from the front line, as it were. <clears throat> from the WHO point of view, the, in, to answer your question, uh, Jenny, the, the challenge that we have is because we get such a range of impacts that we need to deal with. Um, depending on where you are in the world, climate change will either hit you with heat waves or it will, it will hit you with floods or it will hit you with drought or it will hit you with wildfires. And it may do that one after the other. So we, we have to be up to the extreme weather events that, that are, are challenging our health systems. But one of the other challenges that we have is it's not just the extremes, it's also the gradual buildup of, of stress on the ecosystems, the ecological systems, which determine disease rates. So we're just as concerned about and, and, and populations are just as impacted by the effect of warming temperatures on the transmission of vector diseases like malaria and dengue and so on. And then finally, the, the really big things that we have are the impacts of climate change on social systems. Uh, on the and on the the determinants of health, and so it, at WHO we've carried out work over the years. We we estimate very conservatively that, that climate change will already be causing about two hundred fifty thousand deaths uh, a year, um, just from those kinds of impacts that I've just described: impacts on uh, infectious disease, uh, heat stress, and so on. But it is a much more fundamental challenge uh, than that. And it's one of the reasons why we were so keen to make this connection to the Pacific, because in certain parts of the world, um, whether it's in the Pacific or low lying uh, areas in, in Bangladesh, climate change is a survival issue. Um, we heard right at the beginning of the day uh, today that for each one degree centigrade increase in temperature, you get about you know, latest estimate, something like a one uh, meter increase in sea level. Um, in, in, sea level rise, increase in sea level. Now, there are parts of the world that don't have a meter to play with. Um, that level of warming, that level of sea level rise will eventually wipe out countries. Uh, and that is, and, and that kind of challenge is a completely different scale of challenge, a completely different kind of challenge to when we're talking about individual diseases. So, you know, at the moment, we're massively challenged by, uh, by COVID. But today we hear the news that, that one of the first candidate vaccines it has, seems to be a very, very, very promising. And for diseases like that, once, once you get, get a vaccine, once you can roll it out, you can really make a massive impact. For climate change, we're never going to have a vaccine for, uh, for climate change. Because of the diversity of impacts, we're going to have to strengthen the whole system. Uh, and so just briefly about what we need to, to, to do to, to deal with that. And again, we, we heard from um, uh, Mr. Assi at the, uh, at the beginning, we, you know, I would say there are three main things. The first one is way upstream. Um, and even to increase resilience, it has to start with mitigation. It has to start with cutting carbon emissions. And for those most vulnerable populations, which have contributed very little to greenhouse gas emissions, it's not about so much about asking them to cut carbon emissions. It's about making clear to the world that if the big economies, if the big populations don't cut their, their emissions, then that means you know, the end of, uh, of other parts of the world because we will go beyond the limits to which um, we can become resilient or which we can adapt. The very good news on that is, of course, that almost everything we need to do to cut carbon emissions, if we do it right, brings massive health gains that actually pay for the cost of mitigation. So we should be able to make this case that if you're in a a, a rich country or a rapidly developing economy, a clean energy system or a sustainable transport system is fantastic for health as well as, as, well as cutting carbon emissions. So that's number one. The second is to recognize, and, and I think we've already heard, heard this as, as well, that most of health is actually determined outside of the health sector. So it is, as, as we've heard, it is about guaranteeing supplies of food, safe, nutritious food. It's about guaranteeing safe water supplies. Um, and so health has to get behind the adaptations that need to take place in, in, in other sectors, the provision of those services and making sure they're resilient to climate change. So that's number two. 
But the, the third one is to recognize there are things that, that can and should be done within health systems. Um, we can't do everything through, through, our, through, other, um, through other systems. Our health systems are already being impacted by climate change and we need to take care of them. And Dr. Irfan mentioned that he thinks he's sort of surprised this isn't priority number one. Um, we think it should be priority uh, number one. The protection of people's health is, is absolutely top of most people's priorities when you talk to them about, uh, about climate change. And the health system is also 10% of the global economy. It's just about the biggest employer in the world. It employs the most trusted people that are most embedded in communities. So it is a really good place to start with adaptation and resilience. And the, just to, to, to get towards the end, the, the other good news about this is we actually do know how to do much of this stuff. Um, you know, we, we're hearing that you know, we, we, don't know, we don't know all we need to know. But we do know many things that would already be a really good idea, which would also increase uh, resilience to, uh, to climate change. Uh, we have quite a lot of experience now in working with countries, supporting countries around the world uh, on this. And we're able to basically boil this down and say, if you look at the core functions of, of health systems, the core building blocks as we describe them and as health systems people describe them, finance, information uh, uh, systems, uh, health workforce, most importantly, uh, delivery systems, technology and infrastructure and so on, you can show how you can build climate resilience onto each of those. And we've been doing a lot of that now around the world. And just last month, we published guidance specifically on climate resilience and environmentally sustainable healthcare facilities that shows how you do that within, within an ind individual facility. But just to quickly say to the, 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 the remaining challenges that we have, most countries or a lot of countries actually now have a pretty good plan. About half of countries have a good plan or strategy on health and climate change, but we do have a problem with financing. Um, so the real problem is we, we're not connecting up the climate imperative with the health imperative. And so the climate finance, which is now coming in, only about half of 1% of that at the moment goes to health. We think that's not enough. And so that, that needs to change. But really, the, the, the final point I, I would make is that this is more than just project funding, which needs to come in from outside to protect vulnerable communities. It has to be just the normal way in which we do business now. Because climate change is putting into place all of these stresses, um, it needs to be just part of any investment that the health system makes now needs to take account of, of climate risks. And just to, 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 to finish off, um, right at the beginning of this, uh, of this day on climate change and health, we had an opening statement by Prime Minister Bainamarama of, uh, of Fiji and in, in his statement, um, he says that no country regrets the investments that they made in health systems as we're now being faced by the, by the COVID challenge. In fact, most countries wish they had done more. So that is where I, I think we need to, to start is, is recognizing the absolute necessity to, to invest in health systems and just as part of core business, make clear that making them climate resilient and, and paying the additional small amount of extra cost up front is a really good investment for the long run. Thank you. Yeah, um, excellent, uh, excellent overview and, and contextualizing of what, um, what role health systems play in overall resilience and adaptation. And we'll actually come back around at the end to talk a little bit more about um, the issue of finance. Um, but I, th I think also, um, I want to now bring in uh, you, Mr. Carliner. Um, and so Healthcare Without Harm works with um, private and public health systems around the world. Uh, from your uh, experience working with those partners around the world, what are you seeing? What does it look like in actual health systems that are both grappling with these impacts and and in the case of those you're working with, trying to do something about them. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Miller. Um, and good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody, especially a very early good morning to Dermot over there. Um, it's, it's nice to see you up so early. Um, you know, I have three thoughts about this and then actually a couple of announcements that I wanna make that kind of relate to it. Um, so the first thought is that, you know, there's a quite an interface that people have been talking about um, this evening for me, um, between COVID-19 and um, climate change, in that COVID-19 has underscored the need for greater health system resilience to fight pandemics. There's no doubt about that, right? 
And then at the same time, such resilience is also needed to withstand the impacts of climate change, floods, storms, heat waves, fire, drought, migration, disease, displaced people, which all put tremendous pressure on health systems. Um, and so my first point really is that building both pandemic and climate resilience is essential to protect um, our health systems everywhere and to especially protect the poor and the most vulnerable, both among and within nations, um, as those most severely impacted by these twin global crises. My second thought is that healthcare climate resilience needs to include infrastructure, supply chain, operational resilience, and health systems also need to play a role in building community resilience. In this way, health prevention and universal health coverage, UHC, um, can be a resilience strategy. In other words, the stronger the health system, the healthier the population, the greater the resilience. So how do we get there? Several of the leaders during the opening session of the Race to Zero Dialogue this morning in Europe emphasized to achieve the world's climate goals, broad thoroughgoing systems change is necessary. And I would also argue that the same changes are needed to achieve our global health goals. So to meet global climate and climate, global climate and health goals, to build resilience, we need to transform how we use energy, how we transport ourselves, how we grow and harvest our food, and how we deliver health. The third thought is that, sort of Dermot referred to this earlier, um, we also know that as climate change and its impacts escalate, it will be increasingly difficult to build resilience. Um, the pressure on our communities, our society, our health systems will grow. And that's why we all need to work for this kind of systems change, this transformation to a resilient net zero emission society that prevents the worst impacts of climate change from happening. Um, and as part of that work, those most responsible for the problem must do the most. Those in places like my country, the United States, must do the most. And at the same time, everybody must do their part. So while there's often a dichotomy between resilience or adaptation and mitigation, healthcare without harm sees, re sees resilience and mitigation as a false dichotomy. Mitigation and resilience can often be two sides of the same coin. And some of the changes we need to implement um, for resilience are the same ones that we need to move toward net zero and vice versa. So Dermot said there's no vaccine for climate change. That's true, but when we create the vaccine for COVID, we can make it climate friendly. We can create a, a climate friendly cold chain that is powered by renewable energy and invest in uh, a uh, climate resilient low emissions or zero emissions um, cold chain in the health system that can, um, that can also address the pandemic. So for healthcare specifically, for hospitals and health systems, we must not only be the last building standing or the anchor in our communities on the front lines of emergency response, but we also must be the leaders in reducing the 4.4% of net global emissions that healthcare is responsible for. And we must reduce it to net zero by 2050 at the latest. And so that requires fundamental systems change in terms of how we deliver health. We have to rethink and reinvent it in many ways. As the minister for the Cook Islands said in her intervention earlier, imagine a future where climate resilient, sustainable healthcare systems are the norm. So in that context, I have two exciting announcements to make. So first of all, um, Healthcare Without Harm is honored to announce that we, um, that our Healthcare Climate Challenge initiative will become the official healthcare partner of the UNFCCC Race to Zero campaign. So this is a Race to Zero dialogue, and I'm sure most of you are aware there's also the Race to Zero campaign um, that's organized by the UNFCCC, um, and it rallies leadership and support from non-state actors, from businesses, from cities, from regions, and investors for a healthy, resilient, zero carbon recovery that prevents future threats, creates decent jobs, and unlocks inclusive, sustainable growth. So our Healthcare Climate Challenge will bring hospitals and health systems from all around the world into this Race to Zero campaign. The challenge, which we launched in Paris five years ago, is based on the pillars of mitigation, resilience, and leadership. It currently has over 300 participants representing the interests of more than 22,000 hospitals and health centers in 35 countries. And the Climate Challenge participants have already reported collective commitments to reduce their carbon emissions by more than 34 million metric tons. 
So the race to zero for healthcare will be a high bar component of the challenge, of the healthcare climate challenge, which will mobilize the sector to align with the ambition of the Paris Agreement, move toward net zero, and join other sectors in doing the same. And we're just thrilled to be part of it. And we're really excited to work with you all and with hospitals and health systems around the world to build a cohort from healthcare that's doing its part. And so in the first part of 2021, we will formally launch Race to Zero as a component of the Healthcare Climate Challenge with an initial cohort of hospitals and health systems committing to zero emissions. And this of course builds on the recent announcement by the National Health Service of England that they are committed to net zero. And they're the first major national health system anywhere in the world to make that commitment. Our goal is to bring everybody else along around the world. And so Race to Zero for Health will also be part of a new exciting suite of resources that will build a comprehensive transformational approach for helping move the healthcare sector towards zero emissions and resilience. That will include a global roadmap for healthcare decarbonization, a healthcare um, carbon footprint measurement tool to help facilities um, get there in a practical way, and a series of other high impact strategies for decarbonization, resilience, and leadership. So that's the first announcement, that's the big one. And the second one really quickly is that I'm really pleased to announce also that for those of you who are in the Southeast Asia region, which um, you all are awake at this point, um, and uh, we are um, Healthcare Without Harm Southeast Asia, which is based in Manila and operates throughout the ASEAN region plus a few other countries, will launch a new inclusive alliance of healthcare leaders to advance climate action, health equity, resilience, and healthy recovery in Southeast Asia. It's called RISE, the Southeast Asia Alliance for Health and Climate. And it will include at first participants and members from Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, Singapore, Taiwan, and South Korea. Um, and it complements our global green and healthy hospitals network in the region as a vehicle for individual health professionals um, and those who work in different institutions to join doctors, nurses, public health advocates to take collective action for climate and health in their countries. Um, and so it, I will put uh, the contact person is Claire Westwood, who uh, lives in Malaysia. She's from Malaysia. I'll put her, her email in the chat. If you're from Southeast Asia and you're interested, uh, I just wanted to give folks the opportunity to uh, join that effort to build resilience, to build mitigation, and to transfer healthcare in the 21st century. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Josh. And uh, um, really exciting announcements. Um, it's wonderful to have the health sector walking the talk as well as talking the talk in and leading on this issue um, and really excited to see the these things roll out uh continue to roll out in the coming months and and year um okay i now want to bring dr aletha ward into the into the conversation and um aletha ward is a lecturer at the school of nursing and midwifery at the university of southern queensland um, and Dr. Ward, um, you work quite a bit on uh, food system issues, food access, um, community well-being in the context of climate impacts and carbon emissions. So there's been a lot that's been discussed in, in the conversation so far. Um, wh what would you, what are the issues that you think um, that you would highlight from those perspectives of thinking about food security and, and also kind of broader community well-being um, in, the, in the work that you do? Thanks, Jenny. I appreciate that. Um, and some great remarks from um, Damid and Josh. Um, as you'd be aware, in Australia, we certainly um, have and continue to experience extreme weather events, as well as those gradual build-ups of the ecological stress like Damid had discussed. However, firstly, I'd just like to uh, reflect on the comments both from Damid and Josh in regards to our healthcare systems. Um, so, you know, broadly now we're very much needing to reorientate our healthcare systems to shift towards a funding system that promotes health uh, rather than just providing that curative services, uh, particularly with these threats that climate change will and already have started to create. And building resilience into both our healthcare systems and community um, really means that our systems need to be, as Josh and Damad um, have pointed out, we need to be a leader in reducing emissions and advocating for this change. Um, we need healthcare systems very much based on that population health approach, which we're starting to uh, do in Australia. We need to integrate evidence base 
um, and evidence-based information and in the spirit of sharing and transparency, and that's beyond politics. And we need that adaptability to our fast changing conditions and, and what's occurring um, and flexibility with our solutions and responses. And we also need a healthcare system very much based on self-determination and community controlled healthcare systems. And that's particularly pertinent for our indigenous uh, populations. Um, and, you know, just being aware of our strengths and weaknesses and potential threats that we already have in our systems and how we're best to respond. Uh, so for example, um, you know, last year in Australia, bushfires raged, uh, well, in the last 12 months uh, throughout Australia, as I'm sure many of you saw uh, on the news, in addition to our very tragic loss of human life, um, more than 3 billion animals were killed or displaced. And what that actually means, it had a direct impact on our food security and food sovereignty for our Indigenous people in Australia, particularly those who live in rural and remote areas. I would mention that I do believe Australia does lead the way with some self-determination in regards to our Indigenous healthcare organisations. We have our Aboriginal control, community controlled healthcare organisations. And I just want to reflect on when we're coming up with these solutions, we really need to make sure that they are community controlled um, and that we're integrating our community as key stakeholders, um, not only key stakeholders, but leaders in, in these solutions. And really think broadly about, you know, what, what is healthcare and what's required for our health and wellbeing. And we know, for example, that climate change directly influences food insecurity and food sovereignty as far as access, uh, availability, use and safety of our uh, food for our entire community. Did you want me to go on to discuss some, some food insecurity issues that we're, that we're having at the moment, Jenny? Yeah, if you could give us a, a taste of, of, so to speak, a taste of, of what those, the, what the, what people are actually experiencing and what some of those issues are. Well, I guess, you know, we have an ongoing issue with drought in Australia. Well, it usually is one or the other drought or floods or bushfires. Um, but, and that causes not only disrupt, a disruption in growing food um, or access to food, like the, um, you know, animals that I was just discussing, but also the distribution networks, uh, particularly when, you know, climate crisis occur. And, you know, that's devastating and will drive hunger and death in emerging nations. But for developed countries such as Australia, the US, Canada, that can actually uh, make people increase their intake of nutrient poor food. So there is a um, paradox called the food insecurity obesity paradox, where people who are mild to moderately food insecure, and this is about that ecological, um, you know, long term stress. Um, it actually um, creates and further drives our obesity issue that we have in Australia and in many developed uh, nations across the world. And, you know, our corresponding non-communicable health uh, outcomes from that, uh, for example, our huge, um, you know, uh, rates of cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, et cetera. So um, I think we need to think really broadly when we think of climate change and its impact on food security. Obviously, for some people, that will mean hunger and you know the devastating impacts for that in other communities that may actually um, increase our obesity rates and obviously our um, health issues from that. Yeah thank you and the, and the theme that kind of um, comes out for me in, in some of your comments there is the ways in which um, vulnerabilities uh, build upon one another so impacts build upon one another and and uh, being impacted in one way creates a, a type of stress or a, um, a vulnerability in a different way. And I think we've heard that um, from, from several of, of the speakers emerging uh, in different ways. Um, and so at this point, I'd actually really like to bring the rest of our speakers back um, and have kind of a shared conversation reflecting on all of this. So, We've talked a lot about um, what the challenges are, both broad in broad strokes and uh, the fact that uh, adaptation and resilience are very localized um, and the impacts, the specific impacts are unique to different locations. We've talked about a number of the kinds of solutions and types of things that need to be built into the solutions, um, community leadership, collaboration, um, having an, an advanced plan, 
um, you know, thinking about thinking holistically about the context that we're in. Um, what I'd like to ask all of you now to reflect on, and I think each a bit briefly so that we can kind of hear from everyone is how do we raise ambition around these issues? And then to come back to the point that you made, Diarmid, how do we increase the funding to accomplish all of this? So how do we put, how do we elevate this in, in global priorities, um, raise the ambition, make the commitments to really tackle these issues head on? Um, and how do we, uh, how do we generate the climate finance to, to support this kind of work? Who would like to jump in first with a thought? Jenny, I will um, jump in there, no one else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think, and, and this is uh, very much a culmination of what many speakers have said um, tonight or today, wherever you are uh, in the world. But, you know, we need to be leaders uh, within uh, health care and uh, really advocate for policy change. We need that population health approach and really rethink what, what our health care system is now, but what it needs to be in the future, because otherwise we will always be reactive uh, to it. But it, it's very difficult when our funding, our healthcare funding systems are based on, you know, we call it in Australia activity based. Uh, funding where, you know, we, we get paid to look after patients who are already sick, not to care for the ones that, you know, are vulnerable um, to threats such as climate change. Yeah, that's a real challenge. The, the flow, the way the funding flows can really restrict what kinds of solutions are, are possible. Yeah, Saima. Hi, yeah, I just I like to add, I mean, one of the things that in this last several months is the, the reality is that we have each country has been hit economically very hard. And that is, you know, um, a, a wake up call that we have vulnerabilities that are there that are um, the way we have planned. So I think going forward, we have to think about how uh, the um, health funding all countries have health funding, but how we utilize it also impacts why, when we plan for disaster kind of management and planning. Because oftentimes we have separate agendas and this is a clear cut needed to maximize the funds that we have we, when we create concrete steps so that it would support the infrastructure the health system that is already there but at the same time also sub, uh, sub continue to support in um in, in situations that are unexpected um having really concrete ideas but also um like doable ideas uh, something that can be done can be um, um a much more cost effective rather than going through um, larger expensive systems. We found that in, uh, uh, say, in Bangladesh, a very simple process was we're very fortunate to have a large population. So having call centers and having people kind of calling in, giving them help within that um, the home setting was actually much more uh, effective. So innovative ideas, but concrete steps towards innovative ideas and maximizing on the fund, I think that would uh, would be a good way to go forward. Yeah, Josh. Yeah, just to build on that, um, you know, I, I think that obviously climate finance needs to finance health, but health finance can also become climate finance. Or if climate change is the greatest health threat of the 21st century, if we truly believe that, what the Lancet said and what WHO has said, then that means how 10% of world GDP is invested uh, needs to be invested in a climate smart way. Um, and so um, Secretary Herman mentioned this um, when, when she was talking about the hospital on the hill that um, you, you, you're not using anymore and you've decentralized your, your health system. You've chosen, I imagine, to invest your health resources in greater resilience. And that, that kind of investment can help make healthcare an anchor for community resilience. And we've seen examples of that around the world. Um, and it can help um, actually move the economy toward a uh, 
uh, more climate friendly future, uh, both in terms of resilience and mitigation. So I, I would think about, you know, how, how does health use its own dollars, its own resources um, to do this? Yeah. Somebody else want to jump in? Yeah. If I could jump in on that, and, and I think jump in on both questions at the same time, how do we raise ambition and, and how do we generate the finance? I think it's important for the health community to be quite assertive in, in terms of raising ambition. Um, you know, we argue that health is not only the greatest threat, uh, sorry, climate change, not only the greatest, greatest threat to health, but action on climate change is the greatest health opportunity. And I, I think we should not shy away from being quite political uh, about this, that if you ask people, you know, how many deaths do you think are tolerable because of climate change or how many deaths from air pollution are OK? If you ask people that question, they will say zero. It's not it's, it's not OK that we continue to expose people to risks that could be could be avoided. And, you know, the reality is there will be some that could could be avoided. But. But I don't think we're being as assertive as we could be to say this, this is not OK. We should not have large numbers of people, for example, dying from uh, unclean air or in the in the way of, of, of climate disasters. And, and countries like Bangladesh, for example, have done a fantastic job over the last couple of decades in massively reducing the numbers of people killed in uh, in, in cyclones because you know, they, that was a made an issue and the investment went went in. And then on, on, on the finance, I, I'd like to, to follow on from, uh, from Josh's point, because I, I think we do need to make the case that, that more or least some climate finance goes to, to health. But it, it does just need to be, as I said earlier, the, the way that the investments are made. Um, we work with major donors on health adaptation to climate change, and we were doing work on water safety, safety planning. And one of our biggest donors said, why would we invest in a water safety plan that wasn't climate resilient? Nowadays, that makes no sense. So, so it should just be one of the questions that get asked, gets asked about any, uh, any investment. And there may be some higher upfront costs, but if we do it right, the, the, you know, the, it's clear the analysis is there that it will reduce costs over the long term. So that's the, 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 the systems change, I think, in thinking that we uh, that we need. And, and as Josh says, that's not just external climate money, it's also the way that the, the health sector puts in its own money. Does somebody else want to jump in? I think the, 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 um, the point that um, we've not yet addressed around this uh, in thinking about that, that financing piece is um, financing between countries, you know, so in some countries, health systems are quite well funded and could turn dollars uh, towards uh, becoming more climate smart. Um, but other countries uh, need support in order to um, address their health system needs, uh, as well as their other adaptation and resilience needs. And um, I think in the uh, in an earlier session today, focused on on finance, um, uh, Professor Jeffrey uh, Sachs really called to account some of the ways in which uh, um, individuals in this world are are uh, profiting quite greatly and leaving many others behind. Um, how do we how do we ensure that? You know, we've been talking a lot about very vulnerable populations, countries, geographies. How do we ensure that the finance that's needed in those places actually gets there? Well, I'll jump in with one, one thought and then I'm sure maybe, maybe it'll help spur others as well. Um, so development assistance for health um, you know, what comes from the World Bank, other multilateral development banks, bilateral aid agencies, is about 37 billion US dollars a year. Um, and arguably it needs to be much more to achieve global health goals like universal health coverage. Um, and that, those resources can also um, and should um, be oriented around climate. 
now. Just it's sort of the same conversation we've been having about other health investment. Um, and you know, institutions um, like the World Bank often um, wind up setting policy and frameworks. Um, whether one likes it or not, it, it seems to be a reality in many places for many national governments and ministries of health um, through their health Nutri nutrition population group and through other loans and aid that they provide. And so to the degree that that can be made more climate smart, more climate friendly, more focused on resilience and mitigation um, as a core pillar of um, what they do, um, then that will um, that could really help um, shift things in terms of um, how this money flows. And if that can align with the UHC agenda, it can address the global health issues at the same time. So we're about five minutes out from uh, the end of our session and I'd like to offer an opportunity for each of you just to make a very brief, have a brief final word about a you know one minute um, final, any final thought that you'd like to contribute. Um, and Dr. Irfan Tarek, maybe I could begin with you. Um, thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, just two small observations. One, that uh, the COVID pandemic, I think there's great learning from this. Um, since most of the population was vulnerable to this COVID, I think we need to address health issues, uh, impact of climate change on health issues in a similar fast track fashion and um, a sort of smart um, uh, and efficient way to address um, climate change impacts on health. My second observation is with regard to finance. Um, I think we should have a uh, um, consideration to tap the um, adaptation uh, funds from the adaptation fund and the global Cli um, green climate fund, uh, especially considering regional aspects where regional projects and there. This is where I I think WHO has a very strong role. Um, uh, health impacts and climate change do not does not follow boundaries national boundaries. So I think that there's a a um, uh, um, case to build on for uh, regional projects here uh, to access GCF and adaptation fund um, windows. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Saima, uh, final Hi. word from you, final thoughts? I think you've already taken a lot of extra time. Um, I'd just like to have just one message that we should keep in mind that when we ensure the needs of physical and mental health needs of the most vulnerable groups, uh, whether we do it as a country, whether we do it as linked uh, communities or across borders, when we ensure that, we actually ensure the needs of the larger group. So we should always certainly work with the needs of the most vulnerable. Thank you. Yeah, inspiring thought. Um, Mr. Carliner. Um, I've said my piece, but just one little thought here, big thought with a little phrase, there's a big connection between health equity and climate justice. And that's where resilience lies. Wonderful. Alisa. Thank you. I think, you know, and we focused a lot and rightly so on funding, but for me, it's even, um, you know, we need to bring it back further than that. We need to make sure that countries such as Australia, and unfortunately we are not, um, you know, really leading the way um, in this regard and many developed countries are not leading the way in reducing our emissions and I think we need to act as a global citizen and we need to be uh, cognizant that it's not just about the health and well-being of our um, communities and our healthcare systems but this is about the most vulnerable in the world so I'd really like to see governments stepping up and taking you know emissions reduction seriously it doesn't matter where we live. Dr. Herman. I think today's just been an appreciation of the dialogue mm -hmm. uh, to have, uh, yes, we must always consider our vulnerable populations and our vulnerable countries, because um, it's always good to be reminded of those countries that are already having to face this right now as a, as a, a you know, existential threat. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, just having this opportunity today, today I think is, is, is very good. And I know my minister is also very happy to have made it today. So thank you for the opportunity. And I think for us from a small Pacific Island country, representing some of our uh, Pacific Island countries, um, I think we keep the dialogue going and we'll keep doing our bit in the Pacific region and everyone else needs to keep doing their bit and, and just don't give up. We have, we have no choice. This is it. This is only, there's only one plan. No plan B, we've got to keep going. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Honorable Minister, would you like to add a final thought? You're mute. Uh, you, you're on mute. Um, I have um, given the opportunity to Dr. Herman to speak on our behalf. Thank you very much. Thank you. And finally to you, Yermid. Thanks very much, Jenny. Um, I think, I think the, the only real thought I would have on, on this at the moment is just to recognize how far we've come and how much of an opportunity uh, that we have now. And some of us have been working in this field uh, for a while and have seen this going from an, an absolutely fringe um, issue to one that is now absolutely accepted. There are strong majorities for climate action everywhere around the world. We've just seen some of the biggest economies in the world commit to becoming net carbon uh, neutral uh, in the next couple of decades. And we hopefully will now see a different attitude from the, uh, from the biggest economy uh, in the world. Um, and just basically the, uh, the, the level of, of awareness, and I would say it's not just awareness, seriousness of people, general populations, wanting to know what people are doing on climate change has just absolutely uh, changed within the, even within the last, uh, within the last couple of years. So um, yeah, I think we have everything to, to play for as uh, our colleagues from um, the Cook Islands have, have just said. Um, and I'll, well, I'll finish again with a quote from um, Prime Minister Bainamarama in his, in his opening address. He, he had two lines which stuck for me. One was wake up um, <laughs> and, the, and the last one was the race is on. <laughs> Good, good closing thought. Good closing thought. Okay, well, with this, I want to wrap up our, our conversation. I want to express uh, on behalf of the organizers our immense gratitude to all of our speakers and the, um, the wonderful perspectives that you brought to this discussion um, and this rich, the rich exchange of ideas. Uh, I want to acknowledge all of the organizations that came together to create this health dialogue today, um, the World Health Organization first and foremost, my own organization, along with the Glasgow Caledonian University Center for Climate Justice, um, and the UK Health Alliance on Climate Change, the Center for Climate Change and Planetary Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, as well as the Wellcome Trust. And I also want to encourage everyone to continue to engage with the Race to Zero Dialogues. Uh, they will continue for another, I believe, nine days through the 19th. And throughout the week, there are sessions that will reiterate some of the themes that came out today through the, the health dialogue uh, in, on a number of different thematic areas. So I really encourage uh, folks to check those out. Um, and the one that's coming up um, soonest is one on gender responsive and socially equitable resilience. So picking up the theme of resilience again, that session starts at 6 a.m. GMT. So go take a quick nap <laughs> and log back in. Um, and for those sessions that you are not able to view live, there really have been a tremendous number of very, very rich and uh, fantastic discussions today. So those recordings will be available. Um, you can check them out and we encourage you to do so. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our, our attendees, our audience, um, and the race is on.